And welcome, everybody. I'm Robert Adichie, and I am here to uh, just to announce that Eric Simon is here. Uh, he's going to go over the Aventuria deck customization basics. Uh, so with that, take it away, Eric. Thanks, Robert. Uh, so yes, I'm Eric Simon. I'm the English language line manager for Aventuria. And that basically means that I just check everything to make sure that the game makes sense in English, uh, because we have all of it is designed in German, uh, and we have translators who take care of it. Uh, Christian Lansing, who I think is in the chat, uh, is, uh, yeah, there he is. So um, he takes care of, uh, uh, does a great job with the translation, and usually it's just some tweaking to make things really clear for uh, the English-speaking user. So today I'm going to be talking about deck customization basics, and I'm kind of going to be assuming that you have some awareness of the, the mechanics of Aventuria, because otherwise I'm going to have to explain a lot more. Um, but the, the general structure of Aventuria is that you have a hero deck, and you get to um, just use the regular hero deck that is built for you if you want. Um, but there are also deck customization rules, and those are entirely optional. You do not have to use them. But if you do want to use them, if you're the sort of person who likes to tweak things to your play style, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how that works. So you're going to be seeing my screen this whole time, so uh, I apologize for any stray things that might uh, come around. But let's start by talking about the deck building rules. Whoops. Sorry. So here we have the deck building rules and the only rules you need are these. That's it. It's less than half a page. Um, the important things on here are that you must have exactly 30 cards in your deck and you can include no more than two copies of any card in your deck. We're going to be talking about those restrictions a little bit, especially the two copies of a card and how you work with that. Um, the other thing is that there are hero specific cards. So on every Aventuria card, there's an indicator that shows where that card belongs deck wise. That, that's so, oops, sorry. Uh, so if you do customization and you move your cards around, you can always get the cards back to their original decks. But some cards can only be used by a certain hero. And so if the hero abbreviation is highlighted in black, then that can only go with that hero. Um, so at, when we're choosing heroes uh, in our deck customizing, we're going to think a little bit about what, not only what that hero can do on their hero card, but also what cards come with that card inherently. Uh, then there's uh, a few things about reward cards and emotion and promotional cards, uh, but we're not going to worry too much about that um, until the end. Now, this part is the important part. So here we have um, the category symbols. So there are different types of cards, and these symbols show up on every uh, hero action card. And let's take a look oops, sorry, at how this breaks down. So this is <laughs> this is a bunch of stuff at once. So let me let me go over a little bit uh, about what's what's going on here. This is the first seven heroes. So it's the four from the base set over on the left. Uh, then we have Hilbert from uh, Forest of uh, No Return. We have uh, Ship of Lost Souls, uh, Tialva. Uh, and then Rowena from Heroes Struggle. Um, so these heroes, if we look down, they have a certain number um, of each category that they can use. So for instance, Laeriel, the um, Elven Scout, can use, can have up to six 
close combat weapons, two medium close combat weapons, uh, two, sorry, six light close combat weapons, two medium close combat weapons cannot use heavy at all. Uh, and if you look across, you'll see that only Arbosh, the Dwarven blacksmith, can use heavy close combat weapons, um, and so on down the line. Now, if you look down these lines, you will notice that they add up to much more than 30. So these restrictions are the maximum of a category, but that gives you some leeway in how you do it. So you don't have to include six light close combat weapons and two medium close combat weapons. That would be a bit of a silly deck uh, if you got to that. Now, there might be reasons uh, that you would want to do that, but um, it's unlikely. Uh, but these charts are going to be the, the thing that you use to determine partially, all right, what kind of deck do I want to build and what hero is that going to match? So before we get into the, the, the real nitty gritty of that, I want to talk a little bit about kind of analyzing each hero's strengths and weaknesses. Um, so to do that, I want to look at the core four. Uh, these are the four heroes in the basic box. Um, these are the heroes in the that you start with when you start playing the game. Uh, so first we have Arbosh, and the things that I look at when I'm thinking about a hero and, and what they're going to be good at and what they're not going to be good at. Um, I first of all see that Arbosh is very much focused on melee combat. So he has a 14 in melee. Uh, his basic equipment is a melee attack, and his special ability adds damage to a melee attack. This is this is a melee character. Now, I I see that he also has an average ranged attack, but uh, no magic at all. Cannot use magic at all, and and that goes along with Arbosh looking at uh, his, so he cannot use spells at all. Uh, so in fact, the two heroes in the base box who can't use spells are Arbosh and the rogue, who we'll get to in a moment. Um, I also see that he has a very low dodge. Five is, the, is very low. It's very low. Um, you're going to dodge 25% of the time, and of course, you, whenever you're rolling d20s, you're dealing with the the law of small numbers. So <laughs> you you hope you dodge 25% of the time. Um, and so you definitely are going to be relying on armor uh, for protection with Arbosh. So you need to think about the fact that he has no magic, which means he can't use any spells that heal. Um, he can't he would need to use equipment to heal. Uh, he's going to need uh, a little bit of extra help to get his ranged up if you want to use both the melee and the ranged. And he's going to need a lot of armor. So his, his basic deck, uh, as you might expect, is built around a lot of weapons and a lot of armor. And that's basis, basically how he works. It's playing up to his strengths, and his weaknesses in the healing and the dodge, um, are. it has to compensate for those. Leariel, the Elven Scout. So she's much better in ranged. Um, well, by two points. She's much worse in melee, uh, and she's decent in magic, uh, but not great. She's got an okay dodge. Her basic equipment, uh, so so she has an ability to guarantee a hit, basically, with a ranged attack. Changing a die roll to a three is almost certainly going to hit unless there's some really extraordinary circumstances. Um, the, the big advantage that Laeriel has is that she is average in all of these, but she's average in all of these. So she's extremely versatile. Uh, she's she's going to be able to do a lot of things across the board. Uh, so you can build her deck in a bunch of different ways. Her special ability, of course, is is really focused on the range, but you could easily build um, a triple threat. Oh, here comes my cat. Sorry about that. <laughs> come on, come on. 
Ah, stream cat shows up again. Uh, all right, so, so, but it's her versatility that's really the strength. Uh, moving on, uh, Carol Ann. Uh, so the half-elf rogue, he's, again, he's, he's going to be kind of average in both melee and ranged, uh, but that's, that's pretty good. Uh, he doesn't have any magic, again, so he won't be able to do any healing. He is extremely good at dodging. So we definitely think about uh, whenever we're playing Carol Ann, uh, especially because his special ability also builds around dodge. Uh, we want to really take advantage, sorry about the cat again, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the dodge abilities. And finally, there's Miraban, who is not great at either melee or ranged, um, but she is amazing at magic. Um, I'm really sorry. My cat is freaking out here. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, okay, so the other thing about Miraban is, yes, she has great magic. Uh, her dodge is not great, so she's going to need to be able to heal or protect herself with magic for the most part. Uh, the other thing that she has is the ability to bring cards back from her discard pile, which is, uh, unlike any of the others, means that maybe we can think about putting more one-shots into her deck. Okay, so that's that's sort of how I would look at each of them. Um, and I, when I'm doing this, I would also go a little bit deeper and uh, dig into, for instance... Uh, I might look at some of the, uh, so here's a black uh, text. There we go. Uh, here's a black text uh, card. So this is Miraban only on this card. And it's a way to get rid of um, a weapon, armor, or equipment card if you're in a duel or in an adventure to subtract two from all the uh, from the damage of all the attacks until the end of combat, which is extremely strong. This is a very strong uh, card, and it's it's really nice to have that in uh, in here. And then arcane meditation. The, there's a couple of those. So fixed matrix is also a really amazing one for mirror band. So this is um, this is a way once you get her really high. Uh, if by adding to her uh, magic stat, you might fail, but you can decide to reroll or draw a card, and suddenly you're hitting almost all the time with magic tests and magic attacks. So that's really valuable with Mirror Man. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, the way that I would look at these and try to figure out what what do I want to do with this deck? Um, so then I go back to here. Uh, and by the way, I know there may be some people listening, but I have no idea how many. Feel free to ask questions at any time if you're interested. Um, this is a very casual kind of workshop. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I knew that not everybody has played Aventuria, but I would love to uh, hear from you if you have questions or have thoughts uh, about what you would like to see. Um, so then we get to the question of, all right, how many of each kind of thing do I really want? Um, so there's some kind of basic principles with this. Uh, the <laughs> If you have seen uh, some of my recent videos on the uh, Ulysses YouTube channel, um, you would know that I struggled a little bit when I tried to solo in of the Black Boar. And one of the reasons that I struggled was because I, <laughs> the, well, in of the Black Boar is, is a rough start, especially as a solo character, because uh, you start very short on good equipment and you're you're very much at the mercy of what random equipment you might pick up um and so uh there's there's a, a basic principle that 
that you need to be able to stay ahead of the enemies. And so when I'm looking at this, what I want to think about is I need a way to do, once I get going, I, I don't need it right away, I don't need it at the beginning, but once I get going, I need to be able to do at least two different instances of decent amounts of damage each turn. Um, so the, the character that I was playing in Inn of the Black Boar had a basic attack that only did three damage. Um, flat uh, was, was not a, a roll, it's just a flat amount of damage, which is nice early, but when that's her only attack plus one other weapon, um, that's then you're just not going to stay ahead, especially in something like the the goblin scenario and in the black boar, sorry, uh, where they keep coming uh, and and new minions keep showing up, and you just have to to keep pounding on them. Um, you have to stay be able to stay ahead of them. You have to be able to do multiple instances of, of damage, or you need to be able to guarantee that you're going to hit really hard at least once, preferably both. So when I'm looking at one of these heroes, and uh, for this one, I'm going to go ahead and continue with Miraban, because uh, I want to think about what she can do uh, and how I might go about customizing. Um, so she needs to be able to hit with a couple of different attacks every turn. Just basic principle, I want to be able to do that. That's that's my starting goal. Um, so I'm looking at things like Attributo, uh, which lets me increase one of my combat stats. So if I include this card and maybe another card, now I'm starting to think, OK, which of my other combat attributes am I going to bring up high enough so that I can make that a viable attacking thing. So, okay, uh, well, let's take a look. She can use, she could have four close combat weapons. She could have two medium, uh, four light close, uh, two medium close, four light range, two medium range. So either way, I've got about the same amount of cards that I can bring in. The uh, her skill is higher on ranged, so probably what I want to do, if I want to bring either of these stats up, it's going to be the ranged. Um, now, I do have one other option, uh, which she has... Excuse me. We'll get back to call Jin in just a moment. Uh, so, Animatio is really helpful. Uh, it is a one-shot, um, but it makes the um, it makes your other combat stat the same as your magic stat. Uh, so this is an extremely useful uh, card for Miraban. So if I had uh, the Attributo and Animatio, if I had two of each of those, uh, so I can pretty much be sure that I'm going to get the Attributo out there, hopefully fairly early. And the Animatios, um, these are one shots, but uh, I can use those at critical times. So if I know that I've got that, then I can rely on probably having a decent enough stat that I can make that my secondary attack. Now, Miraban, in her core deck, has uh, so she has a number of spell attacks and those are no brainers. We're going to put those in um, and maybe maybe we don't bring in the invocatio minor and Myers because they're expensive one shots uh, and maybe what we want is something more stable like the Ignis Pharaoh um, and we we'll just keep that around. Um, but she also has this lovely card. Uh, this is really, really useful, and uh, every deck wants to think about having something like this. Uh, so if I could put two call gins in so that I'm pretty sure to get one out. Now I have a third 
source of damage. And this is not just a source of damage. This is a non-attack, so it cannot be dodged, um, and it bypasses any protection. So this is an extremely useful card to have. If I have this, I have her spells, and then I have some buildup on the ranged, uh, then I'm going to have enough room, hopefully, to uh, to put in the um, some protection and healing, which she is also going to need. So protection like this uh, is very useful, um, and she can. This is a discard after damage. Um, she has some one shot healings, and so once I've got all those built in, remember that I can bring those things back. So one shots are are still useful for Miraban, uh, a little more useful than for others. Um, so then we we really think about all right. So how many of each of these things do I actually want in this deck? Um, so she can have. Let's let's say that we're going for that uh, that combination of ranged, the call gin, and some spells for attacking. Uh, she can't have any armor. She can have equipment, and the equipment is what she'll use uh, to protect herself in addition to the spells. So she can have tons of spells, and so she's going to have some of that. Um, now, she can have up to four light and two medium ranged combat weapons. I don't want to use all of those slots because that is a fifth of her deck and the ranged is, a, is important to make sure that I get it, but it is not important enough to, um, to put that much weight into it. Um, so usually what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to have, uh, I would say, two light and one medium. Now, the question then becomes, do I make the two light ranged the same or don't I? And that's where we start to think about cost progression. So cost progression in Aventuri is extremely important because first turn, I cannot play unless something extraordinary happens and, and I get the right draw. Uh, so for instance, Miraband has the card that lets her uh, spend a life to gain two endurance. Um, but unless I have that in my opening hand, um, or I draw it on the first turn, I'm not going to be able to pay for anything more than two on the first turn, more than four on the second turn, and more than six on the third turn. Um, so I want to think about that cost progression. I, I do want to get things out, um, but it is also important to think about when they come out. Uh, because also keep in mind that for the ranged, um, I'm going to have to be playing cards like Sleight of Hand, which also cost endurance. And I have to, to think about that, that progression as well. So when I'm thinking about all this cost progression stuff, um, I usually want my my damage dealing stuff. I I want my secondary uh, attack stat to be uh, lower in cost, and the main reason for that is that I want to get up to two attacks as quickly as possible. Um, I want to get those things out right away. Uh, because when I've got a basic attack, a basic equipment that is, oh, hey, look, I can do 1d6 damage for an endurance without playing any card. Um, so I'm, I would rather save up my endurance for big spells and not spend endurance in the first few turns on attack spells because I have a very fine, cheap attack spell built into my card. So I want the the low cost attacks to be in the ranged category. So usually I would grab uh, maybe a one, a two, and a three in cost for my um, 
for my ranged attack. Um, now, her basic deck has this cheap quarter staff in it. And you might be thinking, okay, her melee attack is a six. Why in the world would you spend endurance on this thing? Why would you ever spend endurance to attack with it? And of course, the answer to that is, well, you want to gain fate points. So uh, if I attack with a quarter staff and I hit, cool, I just did 1d6 plus 1 damage. If I miss, I get a fate points, and I can use that to make sure that I hit with my big spell. Um, now, this this deck has a short bow in it. I might, since I'm uh, working on making ranged a, a, a primary attack stat, uh, I might do that. I might include the short bow. So we've got a short blow, bow a, a, and a sling. Um, I would probably also put a throwing knife in there, uh, since I'm and and I would do that instead of the quarter staff. So I just don't want the the card slot for the quarter staff. I want to focus on making sure that I get a ranged weapon of some sort out soon. Um, so I'd have a throwing knife, a sling, and a short bow, or maybe something in the three range if I, depending on how other things look. And then I'd probably have two. Uh, skill cards, not just the sleight of hand. I'd also have the uh, the three cost that adds a plus three. So now my range is going to be up to thirteen. If I get the attributo out, uh, it's up to uh, it can be up to fifteen. Um, and then when I really need it, I can get it up to whatever I've got my magic at. So I've got all that going. That's going to be two good attacks. If I get the call Jin out, that's three good sources of damage. Um, yes, uh, as, as you say, attacking as early and often uh, and as often as you can is important. So, um, so yeah, getting that, getting those three sources of damage out there, very useful. Um, so those are the, the things that I'm going to think about. Uh, and then hopefully, uh, by the time I get to my third or fourth turn, um, I'm getting out some of my big, uh, spells. Um, I don't know if I'll, I'll throw. I don't know if I'll include Nightmare Form in this particular uh, deck, but I, I would definitely include the Ignis Pharaoh um, and maybe Wrath of the Elements because it, it would be good to have something on the way to the the big spell. Um, but, but I'm definitely going to include both Magical Lore and uh, the the other one. Uh, research i forget <laughs> i was just looking at it uh but yes so uh so i'm going to include all those i'll probably have some some of these other uh ways to cycle cards uh to gain endurance i will certainly include balsam to heal myself probably disintegratus um armor Church is really important uh for, for mirror man i can't cannot stress how how important this card is uh, to have out. <laughs> um, so these are the kinds of things that uh, I'm gonna keep in there. Um, I don't know. Um, I do like Fulminictus uh, Thunderbolt. Um, obviously, the uh, the <laughs> the second printing errata fixed. The, the most broken thing about it, which was that you used to be able to choose zero. Um, <laughs> um, so, so good on you, Christian, for fixing that one. Um, but, uh, but as a result, I may or may not include it these days. Uh, but yes, uh, definitely in solo play, high magic value and armor truth spell, so important. Um, it's just, yeah, just reducing all the attacks by two um, is extremely useful. And of course, she has the um, the uh, robe. Where are you? Um, she has the robe that lets her draw. Oh, there it is. Uh, draw whenever she uh, loses life. Um, this is this is very useful, especially because you want to 
really control your your hand and your draw. Uh, so that's so thinking about co cost progression, thinking about the sort of the the types of um, decks that you're going to be uh, building towards. So I could also have decided um, that I wanted to be a fate point. Uh, Hoover. Um, one of the things that you could do is um, not raise your uh, your stats other than magic, uh, and then you just have a couple of low attack stats. Um, you make sure you have some cheap weapons uh, for each, and you attack, attack, and then blast with the the spell, um, and that sort of. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Yes, uh, it was necessary. I realize zero was broken. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but I always used it, and I always told people I was teaching uh, the game to use it. Uh, but it's it's better this way. It is. It is. Um, so uh, uh, so so why would I do that? Why would I want a bunch of fate points if I'm only going to use them for one big attack? Well, this is where we come down to kind of thinking about what are you building this deck for? Um, and you have two choices in Aventuria. You're either building it for um, an adventure or you're building it for a duel. Now, if you're building it for a duel, you want to be able to mess with people. Uh, so Disintegratus is so good. Um, and uh, you want to be able to do a lot of uh, big hits. And uh, so that then I would probably just build the ranged and magic uh, deck that I was talking about initially. Uh, but if I was building for uh, an adventure, if I was saying, all right, we're going to customize our decks and then take them into an adventure. So I want a deck that I can really do uh, in adventures. And if I'm working with a team rather than solo, or even if I'm going in solo, uh, I might build the let's get a bunch of fate points version of this deck where I don't increase my melee, I don't increase my range, I make sure that I have attacks with them so that I attack, attack, and then I use uh, I, I use those fate points that I'm going to gain when I miss. Um, I'm going to use those to help me do the hero actions that are in the adventure. Um, so that might be a thing that um, that I want to do. Now, uh, one of the trickiest things in customizing an Aventuria deck that is different from so many other games uh, is that you have to remember that your deck is also your resources. So if you think, I want to be able to play every card in this deck, you're going to have problems. Uh, you need to be thinking, I will have to play some of these cards as endurance. Which cards are those going to be? And this is where a lot of the situational question comes in. So this is why you might have uh, spells that you don't necessarily want all the time. Um, that you only want in certain situations, uh, where you have more weapons than you think, where you have more copies of things than you think you, you would need. Um, so this is why if you're, if you're pretty sure that you want to be able to play a particular card, it's a good idea to have two copies of it in your deck, because one of them may end up as endurance. Um, and if you get the first one early and you know you're going to want to play that card, you hold on to it. Here's my call, Jin. I am not going to put this down as endurance because I need this card. Oh, here's my second call, Jin. Guess what gets to be endurance? Uh, and and so that's uh, that's a big thing that you need to think about. The other thing to think about is um, 
if you have some things that help you in certain situations and are less important in others, but they're very helpful in those certain situations, those corner case cards. Um, it's not wrong to have a few corner case cards because then those are the ones that you can look at when you first uh, get get your first hand and, and you're trying to decide. Sometimes it's really hard to pick those first two endurance. Uh, I usually find it's a lot easier to pick the fifth and sixth endurance card than it is to pick the first two because you're looking at that hand and you're thinking, but this is this is my deck. This is what I want. Uh, and so that's uh, that's the sort of thing that you're thinking about. Um, so planning for endurance cards can be very important. So so for instance, uh, if you were to have a disintegratus or two in your deck, because uh, two would be great with disintegratus, and you're playing and you're building this for an adventure, um, there may be some scenarios where uh, it's you're not as concerned about the damage that you're going to be receiving and a four cost one shot is just not something that you see as an issue and what you really want is the ability to get to uh those hero actions quickly so hey in that case i'm going to go ahead and play this as endurance on the first turn however if i'm in an adventure and i see Oh, that this scenario has a leader or um, or a, a really nasty uh, monster that's attacking multiple time. Well, maybe I'm going to hold on to this uh, because I want to get this out as quickly as possible and then really uh, weaken that that enemy. Um, so having some of these kinds of situational cards where it's really strong in some situations and in other situations you can be sure that you don't need it uh that that can be really useful um but again it's it's a question of how uh how you've built your deck what are you building it for um and uh you know if you're building this for a duel for instance um a weapon armor or equipment card belonging to your opponent and you end up facing another magic focused character or hilbert who just has a bunch of liturgies out um well that this card is going to be a lot less useful in that particular duel um uh interesting christian uh so christian is saying um that some people suggest all one shots should become endurance right away. Um, and I do find that that's frequently the case, uh, but I, I don't want to say that it's always the case. Um, sometimes, like <laughs> if I'm star if I'm playing Miraban and my for my starting draw has a balsam in, in it, I'm probably going to hold on to that because uh, I know I'm going to need it at some point. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's it's definitely something to consider that uh, especially the more expensive one shots are probably going to be bogging down your hand at at first, um, and that is <laughs> part of the reason why I actually anytime I customize, like I love this card, except it's a one shot, and what if I miss? And boy, am I sad when I miss with Invocatio Meyer. Uh, and that's that's definitely a thing that uh, that has happened to me before. I have missed with this card, and it is it is a sad, sad day. Um, obviously, you know you uh, you want to save up the fate points for when you will play this card, but every once in a while, it just doesn't work. And by the time you can play it anyway, hopefully you've got a permanent spell out anyway and and so yeah it does a little bit less damage but it's permanent and i yeah so those are things to think about um uh but yeah so having a couple of copies of things will help you make that choice a little more easily um 
having some situational cards is going to help you make that choice more easily. Uh, but just in general, think about what kind of in, uh, cards are going to be played as endurance right away. Um, and and that's that's one of those things that takes some time. Uh, I will say it's it's seeing every card as expendable is tough in Aventuria, uh, but it's it's essential. Um, all right, so that uh, that's sort of what I've got. If you want to see a more detailed example, um, obviously I did uh, a bit of a uh, discussion about uh, Miraban, but I also have uh, this strategy blog here on uh, the the Ulysses US website where I went into a very very detailed analysis of building a Carolan deck. Uh, and so I, I built this this deck here. You can take a look at uh, my thinking and see uh, how I did that. Uh, I also have uh, this article on endurance where I specifically talk about just what, how do you choose? How do you choose what goes down as endurance? Uh, so these strategy blogs uh, can be very useful. Um, and yeah. And do, do, do. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, I'm just reading Christian. So he says, this weekend, we actually announced the development of the Aventuria Campaign Box, which is a working title, planned for a German crowdfunding in 2021 and then English le version later. Uh, it will contain loads of additional rules for deck construction, including upgrading cards, etc. Ah, ooh, that's very cool. Um, the other thing that you could uh, could check out, um, make sh if, if you're really interested in deck construction, the most essential product I can suggest after the base set is um, uh, Heroes Arsenal, uh, because it has enough copies of all the cards in the base set to bring you up to two copies of each. Uh, so any, uh, so for instance, in Mirrorband's deck, uh, there are some cards in here that there's only one copy of. There's only one Invocatio Maior. If you want to build an Invocatio Maior deck, God help you, but uh, you can uh, if you go pick up Heroes Arsenal. Um, <laughs> it's also uh, that's also where you can get the uh, lovely uh, dice that are color coded uh, for your skills and uh, extra d6s with symbols of the different base set heroes. It's a really cool little expansion. I I like it a lot. Um, but yeah, so check those out uh, and. Uh, what was the name of that expansion? I don't know. If I, what's that? Uh, Heroes Arsenal. Let me see if I can find it in our shop. Since I've got it on my screen, uh, let's go to Aventuria. Do, do, do. <gasps> yeah, there it is. Arsenal of Heroes, sorry. Um, so this expansion. Um, uh, the other thing that this expansion has on it is um, it has a, a variety of errata, uh, a few, some of which all, were fixed in second edition anyway, in the second printing anyway, so, to, so you don't have to worry about them. But it also has some suggestions on different decks for each hero. Um, and it's, yeah, this is just a really useful expansion for the, um, uh, for deck customization. I just really, really recommend it. All right. Are there any other questions at the moment? I think most of the people in here were just kind of hanging out. Uh, so I appreciate you listening to me. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, if yeah. there's any more questions, if you got any questions, go ahead and put them in there. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that at 8 o'clock, uh, Pacific in about uh, 15 minutes. There's going to be a breaking into the RPG industry panel that includes Daryl Hayhurst, Deanna Gilbert, Greg Gordon, and Brian Reeves. And then at nine o'clock, there is a Torg Eternity actual play with uh, John Watson as the GM. Uh, tomorrow at noon uh, Pacific time, we've got uh, the Torg Eternity novels with Richard Baker. And then at one o'clock, we've got a Fading Suns with Bill Bridges and several of the Fading Suns uh, authors, uh, followed by the, uh, the closing ceremony at two o'clock Pacific. 
So All thanks right. for the so, uh, uh, subscription, Strick. Go ahead. Yeah, Eric. thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I'll be. Uh, I'm I'm going to be here for a couple more hours uh, in Discord. So if you want to ask me any questions or just chat about Aventuria, uh, you can uh, talk to me in the meet and greet channel. Cool. Well, um, thanks again, uh, Eric. I've definitely learned a lot. Uh, it definitely made me want to play uh, uh, Aventuria again. I haven't played it for a little while, so it's definitely something I'll be be digging up. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm Robert Aducci, and I will be back at 8 o'clock Pacific time to introduce the next panel. Um, so we'll see you then. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks.